you get from Corpus Christi to HT to Houston Tillotson? Well, when I was in high school, a senior in high school, I used to go get a hamburger at lunch about two or three blocks from the from the campus because I couldn't stand the food in the cafeteria. <laughs> so I, I would go get me a hamburger and I would pass by this house every day. This guy would, sit, would be sitting on the porch. And of course he was a musician. He was a saxophone, a tennis saxophone player. And he would be playing music that I hadn't heard before. He'd be listening to Charlie Parker. Mm. And I'd slow up every day, not wanting to offend him by asking him what that was, you know. So one day he stopped me, he said, say the little dude, come here. So I went over there. He said, I see you slowing up every day, every, every day when you pass here. Uh, do you like what you hear? I said, yeah, what is that? What kind of music is that? And he told me that was progressive jazz. His name was Ponte Hayward. Hmm. And he was from Austin, Texas. So he said, yeah, that's what they call progressive jazz. I say progressive jazz, yeah. I had never heard anything like that before. And of course that was Charlie Pop. Is that you're talking about 1957. Mm. So uh, I made it my business to go over to his front porch uh, at lunch every day when I was in school. And we sit and listen to Charlie Parker and the jazz records. And he told me that if you want to learn something, something about this music, go to, H, go to Sam Houston in Austin, Texas. Of course, little did he know that Sam Houston was no longer there. Sam Houston College was, a, was an all HBC uh, college here in Austin. And it was on 13th and now I-35. Mm. And uh, they closed it and merged with Tillerson College, which is over on, uh, what is it, 11th Street. Yep. They merged in 1952. Well, of course, this was like 57 and he didn't, know, of course he didn't know that. But when I got here expecting to go to Sam Houston, I found out that it was Houston Tillerson. So I enrolled anyway, because there was a plethora of great black jazz musicians here, man, in Austin at that time. And so I fell right in. I thought I was in the right place, which I was. Well, you were welcomed with open arms, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We were all welcomed with open arms. Uh, and uh, the jazz musicians, especially the young musicians coming up then, got a chance to hone their skills. I can remember one day at the jam session, jazz session that they had at the Flamingo Club, which was located on Chicane and 12th Street, right off of 12th Street. And they would have a jam session there, a jazz session there every Sunday afternoon from four to eight. And uh, we would hone our skills. I never, I will never forget, this would stick with me for the rest of my life. I had learned the song Stella by Starlight. And, uh, the older guys would allow young jazz musicians to get up and play. So you, of course, being a young jazz musician, I wanted other people to see me and I wanted to impress them. So one Sunday I went up there and asked him, I said, can I sit in? He said, yeah, what do you want to play? And of course I had practiced Stella by Starlight as a ballad. And uh, he said, guys, he turned to the guys on the stage and said, guys, little brother wants to play Stella by Starlight. He said, come on, little brother, get up here and play it. So I said, okay. So I was ready to play Stella by Starlight as a ballad in B flat. So he said, okay, little brother wants to play Star Stella by Starlight. Here we go. One, two, oh, one, two, three, four. I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> he kicked off a tempo that I had been used to playing it out of ballad. So he stopped the song and said, little brother, when you learn this song, you can come back and play it. He said, uh, but in order to learn the song, you got to learn it in all tempos. So I went back to the college, to the campus, and I practiced Stella by Starlight Boy. I could play it at a tempo 200. So I went back the next Sunday, ready and ran to play Stella by Starlight, any tempo they wanted. So he said, you, you ready to play Stella by Starlight, little brother? I said, of course I am. So he said, little brother wants to turn around to the other jazz musicians and said, little brother wants to play Stella by Starlight. He said, okay, Stella by Starlight in E flat. I said, oh Lord, because I had practiced it in B flat. So they threw me for a loop. He said, when you learn a song, learn it in all 12 keys. Come back when you can play it. I said, oh my goodness. So I never did go back and ask to play again. That's a true story. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. That's a great story, Dr. Polk. I'm so <laughs> glad that he encouraged you and as well as, as, as not and not discouraged you, you know? Yeah, he encouraged me. He said, when you when you learn how to play in all 12 keys, you come back. He, because he said that's the way we do it. If you learn a song, you learn it in all 12 keys. Because and and that really came in handy with me playing behind vocalists, because vocalists pick keys that are comfortable to them, right. not the original key that it was recorded in. And they could play it in any key. So you got to be ready to play whatever key the vocalist wants to play it in. And uh, that was a valuable tool, a valuable lesson that I learned early on that I uh, used my entire life, still use it to this day. Now, how did you get from James Polk and the brothers to the other group that you started called Jamaat? Uh, well, James Polk and the Brothers was a group I started as a result of writing those arrangements when I was a senior in college. So that's how James Polk and the Brothers started. And we rehearsed for seven, or eight months before we even took our first gig. And after that, a lot of the guys moved on and uh, a couple of them passed away. And uh, so then without being, uh, without having a group to play, Alex Cope, who played tenor saxophones and who I did a lot of work with just Alex and myself, tenor saxophone and keyboard players. We played a lot of the hotels here in Austin and uh, places like that, a lot of private parties. So it was suggested that, and then after Mordecai and uh, uh, Joppa opened the elephant, we decided that, hey, well, maybe we should try to put a group together. That's what Alex, uh, decided. So we did with Alex, myself, A.D. Mannion on drums, Dave Morgan on bass, and uh, me on keyboard, and let's see, Randy Zimmerman and Martin Banks. Mm. That was the group. So, uh, and then we called it Jamad, and the name came for the first initial of all the members of the group. <laughs> J was mine, James. A was Alex. M was Martin, A was AD, uh, and D was Dave Morgan. And then later on, after we had formed the group, see, we started with the quintet, and then Randy joined the group. Of course, we didn't put uh, Randy's name on there. It would have been Jamar R. <laughs> <we had. laughs> but we didn't add it uh, because we was already established as Jamar. But that's sure. how that got started. Well, when I was out the first year, with Ray Charles that, that uh, from August through January, I did one arrangement and because I was still writing and I never stopped writing, I did an arrangement of Herbie Hancock's, uh, uh, what's her, what's, is it Birdland? Da, 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 da. Yeah. No, whatever that was. I did an arrangement for Ray, for, for Ray Charles and I asked the band leader Ray Charles band lead at the time. We were in we were in Paris, at the at the uh, Holiday Inn Hotel, where when we went out on the road, we rehearsed usually once a week. I don't care where we were. Ray was going to rehearse the band, and we rehearsed in the lobby in the basement of that hotel, the Holiday Inn. And I asked the band lead at that time, who was Clifford Solomon. I said, "Do you mind if uh, we listen to this arrangement that arrangement that I just finished?" He said, "Not at all." He said, we'll have to wait till we get to rehearse and raise songs. I said, that's fine. So we did. When we re finished re rehearsing and raise songs, he told the band, say, Pope wants to, us to play this arrangement. He just finished and he wants to hear it. So little did I know that Ray was standing out in the hall uh, of the basement and he heard us rehearsing that. So when we finished, he came in and he said, Clifford Solomon was the band leader's name at the time. He said, Sob. Who did that? And, it's, and Clifford said, the new boy talking about me. <laughs> so he, Ray Charles bought that arrangement. He put that in the book. So we played it from then on when I was there. So he bought that. That was the first arrangement I sold to Ray Charles. Amazing. Yeah. Having been in Austin, you know, for, for your life and being such a, an amazing, respected teacher and musician, what would you like to say to the Austin jazz community or to people learning about Austin about your lessons and things that we could learn from your experiences? Well, to musicians, I would say, 
keep doing what you're doing because it's a once in a lifetime deal. Everybody that loves music, and I applaud them and appreciate them because they're doing what they want to do. And it's hard to make a living as a musician because people do not see music and musicians as a musician sees music and musicians. People enjoy music. They support music if they like it. But if you do it, don't do it for the sake of just making money. Do it for the sake of if it makes you feel good and if you enjoy doing it. And I'm sure that's the reason why a musician becomes a musician because they enjoy the music. It's something that keeps you fit. It's something that you enjoy doing. And it's a thing that very few people get a chance to do in their lifetime. Think of the amount of people that are work out there working nine to five every day doing something that just goes against their grain. They're doing it because they need, have a need to make a living. But a musician is different. I realize that people do not, if you're not a musician, you don't see music as a musician does. A musician sees music as something that's a part of them, a part of their life, a part of their livelihood. So that's how I see music. And to the message to musicians is keep on doing what you're doing and to learn as much about music as you can. Learn to appreciate music. And if you're not a writer, try it. It's so wonderful to be able to create music because as I used to tell my students when I worked at Texas State, that everybody has music in their soul. Everybody has rhythm. You couldn't walk if you didn't have rhythm. Everybody has rhythm in their soul. And music is like, is in the cosmos. Why do you think a person living in New York will find out that they wrote a song that's very similar to a person that lives in California and they don't know each other because music is in the cosmos. It's in the cosmos. Not to, to tell my students that everybody has an extension cord and it's up to you to plug into the cosmos because how do you think melodies come to you? Because it's in the air. You can hear a melody in the wind. You can hear a melody in the chimes. So music is a part of life. If not, people, there are a lot of, everybody's not going to be a writer, but at least everybody can enjoy music. And a lot of people don't enjoy music, and they really don't know what they're missing. 